Welcome to Experience Focus Leaders. Now, one of the privileges of being a founder is that you get to work with customers who have innovation in their blood and who help you co-create the change you seek in the world. And the only thing that's better than one of those super customers is to have that super customer come back. So Eric West is a two-time relate to super innovator. First as a senior leader at one of the largest global agencies, Omnicom Group, and now at Cal Cody, which, who's a leader in a global marketing execution services was origins from legendary R.R. Donnelly, the print and publishing conglomerate. So without further ado, Eric, welcome to the Experience Focus Leaders. Thanks for having me, Alex. Well, Eric, um, one of the treats uh, is to discover people who are not afraid to take a risk even though they are operating inside you know a larger institution where there's a lot of incentives not to change things right they're they're like and it's a hard lift to to not only take a bet on a new vendor but you know to implement it have the vision get the buy in um, for folks that may not be as this predisposed to innovation as you may have in your in your blood. And so you're the sort of change agent that I see inside large organization that combines innovation strategy and getting stuff done on the operational level. Um, so how do you make this happen? How do you, cause I'm sure you do it with us, but you, you do it with other organizations. What kind of, what, first of all, what motivates you personally and, you know, how do you succeed getting folks on board who don't necessarily report to you? Yeah. Uh, great question. So, um, a lot of the roles that I've had most recently have been in the uh, the growth product or strategy area. So I'm I'm fortunate to have roles where my my uh, my job is to find innovative solutions and to do something different in order to help us uh, grow or refine what our what our products are. So it always helps to have a job where it's your job to bring up. Uh, new ideas. But, um, but aside from that, I think, you know, for somebody who maybe doesn't have the luxury of that role, um, it, it's a lot about aligning what the goals are of the organization to the, the innovation or supplier in this case, um, that you're bringing to the table and making sure that that connection is, um, is really linked. So, uh, another big thing is uh, figuring out how to separate out the the big bets from the you know from the smaller incremental um, ideas that will help prove out potentially a larger bet. So one of the great things I, I enjoyed working with you the first time about three or four years ago is when we when we first met. Uh, Understanding the the value proposition and understanding what it could be um, was was initially pretty challenging, not just for me but for the rest of my organization because it was new and we mm -hmm. hadn't tried something like this. So what was great is being able to do that incremental step of figuring out how to get a how to get a demo, how to align it and make it look closer to what our industry was at the time and then figuring out how we can make a commercial model that that makes sense where we both succeed and then uh, after we had that um that startup time that was able we made the case and was able to sell in a larger a larger um program and relationship and i think that that model applies to a lot of the innovation projects as well if you go in there trying to swing for a home run without um the luxury of a lot of mm -hmm. r d and research yeah it's going to be challenging so you need to provide like a quick win evidence that builds momentum to then build a case versus let's go build the case and that ends up kind of an endless process is the case strong enough is this real will this work here you're de-risking a lot of things so almost like the way startups tend to call these things mvp uh minimal viable exactly. product you're introducing a minimal viable innovation. Does that sound right to you? 
I think that's, yeah, I think that's exactly right. And, and even though I've had relatively uh, senior roles about bringing innovations, I've never had a blank check scenario where my job was to bring a $10 million investment idea to the board and expect it to get, uh, you know, approved from, you know, a, a spreadsheet. So I think having having this minimal viable innovation or product idea is almost a requirement in, in many businesses nowadays. Well, let's let's take us, you know, take a step because almost everybody knows Omnicom Group, right? Or one of the agency companies that kind of are part of Omnicom. So that's the first time we've met. And, you know, to an outsider like myself, it would have seemed like, duh, it's obvious that, you know, advertising agencies with all these amazing content would be kind of the earliest, earliest adapters of ours. And they would just kind of jump on on, on board. But it, it's non-trivial. And so what, what are some of the challenges that you typically encounter in bringing innovations, like in terms of procurement processes or, you know, the levels of the buy-in that you need? And, and could, what are the ways in which you manage to, to navigate through that besides the sort of trial, right? Like, do, is it relationship building across the teams? Is it doing the this, this sort of projects frequently enough? So you actually know what the process is to get something new. We it kind of it seems that some people just know how to get it done in whatever organization they're in, and some people want to get it done, but end up playing innovation tourism of some kind and just you know do show up with a bunch of slides and then nothing happens and a lot of talk, uh, but nothing happens. You make things happen, and then those things succeed over time and expand. And I wonder what you've learned from doing this in multiple large organizations now? Why, well, I, you know, the first question you asked was about like, why, maybe why does that happen? Why is it difficult? Yeah. I think, I think it's, um, it's pretty simple. I think it's, it's inertia. There yeah. is something, there is something about being the, the safety of a larger organization. There's distributed decision-making, there's, you know, uh, you know, a public company with investors, you know, your jobs more likely than not secure versus a startup environment. So I, I think with that, it's easier to go with what has already happened or not make a, you know, a big splash. Um, I think, I think the, the way to get it done, absolutely. Um, relationships is a, is a large one. You have to build a reputation for people uh, to ex- ex- uh, accept your your point of view or some of your ideas and and be open to listening to them. So if you haven't built the relationships where they're at least open to listening to your idea, then that's obviously going to be a challenge. Um, I, I I think it's also a bit about the the energy you put into it from an executional level. So one of the one of the um, things I try to do, but it's also, a, a, to be honest, a, a challenge in my career is is the split between operating at the 30,000 foot level of having a neat idea and a concept and a framework, and then getting down to the five foot level and seeing how does it actually, how does it actually work? What does the workflow actually look like? What would the ROI have to be and actually get into the weeds a bit? And I think, um, the the pitches and the ideas that come from uh, a practitioner or somebody who's gotten their hands dirty and really understands the process and the problem and the solutions i think not only does that build that respect that respect to listen to the answer um but then you're able to also handle objections uh, a little bit better as well because you can speak more um more accurately about what it's like to have your hands on it so i think that's a that's probably a good way to to build some credibility. And and I love this contrast between, you know, vision and then the the execution granularity. I think all great leaders, you know, from Steve Jobs to Eric West, you know, are able to combine <laughs> <laughs> combine the sort of the balance. And I guess the the thought process, you know, now being a innovative younger organization a vendor, um you know, my my experience of working with you and getting your feedback has been tremendous because you because of that ability to dig in into the product yet connect it to very strategic uh, value. Like, hey, we're going to win that many more deals if we do X, and 
our customers are going to be interrupted in a delightful way versus annoyed if we do why, you know, and here's why and how. And so you had some of the best feedback for us in early stages of developing the platform because you were able to do that. And so a question for you, for me, is like that sounds like a best practice for enterprise or corporate innovator that actually works with organizations like younger ones, like relate to, right? Like where we got to, to, to partner, what do you bring, you know, to some of our ven vendors that you work with on these innovation projects? And obviously you mentored uh, tech stars. And so you've had experience, uh, you know, not just, you know, broadly in our world, broadly coaching young organizations on how to succeed with enterprises. How do you help them, you know, tune their product or turn their value proposition? And what have you learned from that that you could share with, with our audience? Yeah, um, I, I think I've, I've had the luxury of having some experiences. Um, uh, I worked I worked briefly at, at Google at a um, kind of a startup inside of of Google environment. And uh, worked up, uh, worked at a startup, a healthcare technology startup in Chicago, um, and like I mentioned before, had some some roles responsible for strategy. And I think those experiences got me close enough to the product development cycle, both from a you know the, the typical uh, you know technology startup perspective, but also more mature product innovation development cycles. And um, because of that, I had an affinity for, for a, a lot of those types of discussions. And I'm so glad that you framed it as it was helpful feedback, because I could also imagine, you know, some of the other companies I've chatted with and provided feedback on the product, they, they probably didn't think it was very helpful, and maybe another word. Um, but I think, I think just having that connection with the product cycle and being passionate about delivering experience for my customers, I kind of feel like the right companies that I'll jive with and will jive with me are ones that can feel that passion come. And it's not about beating up a product. It's about, hey, I think this would help me. And I can imagine it also is going to help lots of other me's. So you should probably love this idea. Um, so I, th I think that's that's kind of um, how how I approach kind of the conversations I have with with the the younger the younger vendors I, and I the right ones for us are the ones who are receptive to it. Well, we're definitely suckers for your feedback, and I think it's influenced our roadmap. And um, it's it's hard, obviously, as a recipient, and sort of it's it sort of want to say that you can't accept every every suggestion even though you desperately want to you know yeah I, I don't know i wouldn't call myself a pleaser but i am a champion for the customers right for sure and so i would love to to work work our behinds off to to succeed and so how do you help people um figure out what's what sort of like this is a must-have right this is this is like hey i'm thinking about your next steps right and you've done that really well with us if I was you, I'd be thinking about this. This is like, you know, consider it or take this away. This has been confusing, right? Some of the feedback could be, you know, don't build more stuff, you know, simplify it, right? Like you, uh, you, you know, you've worked with organizations where you may be super user. You may have like some folks we love, like Nicole at uh, Omnicom, who are like, you know, amazing, you know, superstar users, but the rest of the organization may not be, you know, as as excited about trying out new things. So you have this balance between uh, sophisticated users and yourselves and, uh, and and like yourselves and, you know, folks that where you need to have a gradual approach uh, to getting them on board and seeing the value. So how do you help even both startups navigate that and kind of roll out change across the broader user population where there are the early adopters, like the startupers was in the enterprise like yourself. And then there are folks that kind of are relatively comfortable with status quo, but would see the value and would want to innovate if there's a value uh, that's visible to them. Yeah, I, th I think, um, you know, this is probably a well-worn 
uh, talk track. I, I definitely don't take credit for it, but I, I think it's really understanding in all of those instances who's the ideal customer profile for the product that you're that you're building and is going to you're going to be able to delight the most and they're going to be able to provide profitability to your to your business and so when i'm providing feedback i guess with you know there's a few different populations but with when it's with vendors a because i understand this i'm very clear with them and i'm like I don't know whether this is the number one thing that's going to help you overall. I'm being very honest. I want this for me. And if it's a great overlap, fantastic. If not, I understand. Um, and then you'll also have to understand that that may not be good enough for me, but that's okay because maybe I'm not your ICP. When it comes to uh, when it comes to internal, it's having that laser focus on what what are the products that we do really well. What can we have that um, value proposition, that compelling value proposition for. And if we do this work, is it going to delight our existing customers um, that much more? And is it going to be able to attract more of those happy customers? And if it's not, if the answers to those aren't yes, then you really have to question why you're why you're working on that, um, why that uh, you're working on that initiative. And that, that kind of goes both for existing companies and for and for startups, I think there's there's a lot of companies that you've seen not do so hot, and that's because there's a lot of folks um, innovating based off of you know a few folks what what internal company thinks that they should be doing, and there's a not enough view of what the customer is really asking for um, and and what they need, and I think that's what you have to just stay laser focused on. Well, well, that's, this is fantastic, right? So you're and we totally subscribe to the notion that again this is actually ironically steve's jobs quote that we've kind of in, 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 you know tattooed on our heads you got to start with the customer and work backwards right and it sounds like that's exactly what you've said multiple times in your words so um guide us a little bit on you know back, like this is this podcast is about experiences obviously here you've had a concrete example creating experiences was related to maybe other innovations that you've deployed so to talk to us about the innovation that you want to create for your buyers, B2B buyers in your case, right? But they're still in the B2C universe oftentimes, right? Like, so they, they have a, an eye for beauty, an eye for, for detail, an eye for um, um, image, image and visual identity that's, that's, you know, on par with the, the best standards around that. So guide me, is are those type, like, do you see some customers expect a different experience? Do you see this also coming up across different types of customers? And, and why did you choose that area to innovate, uh, like partnering with us, you know, in the early days? Because, it, you know, back when you did the original partnership, you know, we had a lot to prove, right? You took, you took more of a risk on an unknown company. Uh, and so there must have been some kind of a pain that you felt more around the needs of those customers that weren't being met. And I think other folks would love to learn from you on how you thought about that process. Um, and again, don't limit it to relate to. Obviously, we, you know, some of our audience will appreciate it, but uh, it could be other initiatives that you've run where you kind of took this reimagined B2B buying experience and customer experience. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm actually going to I'm going to judo your uh one of your assumptions a little bit um you know you, you your question was you know hey what what were some of my b2b customers lacking and and how did i you know how did some of these innovations help those b2b customers and really going back to this icp concept in the roles where you know specifically with with relate to in our in our engagement um my customer was not actually our prospect my customer is the sales organization. My customer is actually the, the account management organization. So it's more about sales enablement than it was really focused on the experience of the, of the prospect. And um, it's kind of like those, uh, those phrases where if you take care of your employees, they'll take care of their, yeah. you know, of the customers. 
And I think that's kind of the approach. So for us, and, and I fully understand why others view relate to as, um, you know, a way to get innovative content and design out there. And it is, um, you know, in a faster way, at least versus the other methods. For us, it was more about how to facilitate a somewhat complicated services discussion. Since the, a, a lot of the services I've um, I've worked with uh, over the last five or six years are multi-headed dragons that can go into many different places of of um, of need and solution. You can't have a linear conversation right. like some some other products, right? You have to have the flexibility to pull up information in a more fluid way that doesn't feel disjointed and it still feels cohesive. No one wants to hear anymore because they've all learned that you can be everyone to all people. So how do right. you craft the conversation with your prospect that is both focused on them and what they need, but also flexible so that you can go into the different dimensions in which you can help them based off of what their key pain points or needs are and what what we really liked about the relay to in this example and the relay to um format is just the the ability to build that content and design it in a way where we could accomplish both of those and have those dynamic conversations so the fo by by staying focused actually more about what would help our sales and account organization staying focused on that that's what's going to lead to better content and discussions with the prospects and, and that's so, kind of so you enabled them that. got it so if i summarize it you enabled them to have both a very personalized and non-linear adaptable conversation as the conversation grew so they were engaged in a conversation and the customer could drive the conversation as well as the rep had a track that they were familiar with and they didn't have to go like oh hold on let me pull up this presentation or that spreadsheet or this catalog you kind of had a joint joint experience i know i know you also delivered it sometimes in a digital format uh kind of as well like so it was sort of digital in in person where you could have a conversation but also when you were not mm -hmm. in the room at which which you have even less control of um you know frankly yep. right so it sounds like your job was we want to give some superpowers to our team and they're the pros and they want to have those conversations anyway it's just we've been stuck in the old way of kind of monologue tools and sales yes. is no longer a monologue <laughs> you know and people check out I, and it's a conversation right i i can't think of you know i'm i'm obviously a, a buyer of services and um I don't know how long this trend, it feels like it's a newer trend, but it's probably been the case with me since maybe I'm just more impatient than others. But the second I get on a call and a sales organization says, well, let me tell you that, you know, we started 25 years ago and, uh, yeah. and here's, here's our here's headquarter building, you know, big building. <laughs> yeah. And, oh, yeah. And did you know that we used to be called so-and-so 10 years ago and we got bought by so-and-so five years ago? I'm like, what does this have to do with my problem and how good yeah. you are at it? And so, um, you know, it, it feels like there's been this trend of of sales programs and processes over the last um, 10 years, but certainly definitely the last five years, that's way more focused on the discovery call, the challenger sales method, you know, hey, what is what's going on with you? Let's let's understand your business needs and then pivoting to the solution that solves those and it's been really hard to do that with like your standard PowerPoint because you've got your 35 pages with 25 in the appendix. And if somebody asks a question, you're like quickly, you know, flipping oh, to let, the let, appendix. Hold on, yeah. Let me, yeah. 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 Let, yeah. Let me like just click, 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 click. Um, yeah. And, uh, and that, inter that can interrupt the conversation. You're not focused on your client anymore. You're focused on what you need to do to your deck in order to get to the next part of your sales process. And what the the flexibility of the, what we've designed, um, which I'll credit definitely, you know, relate to, but I'll, but certainly the the great marketing talent I've worked with, um, is the ability to take that stress off the salesperson. They can have a natural 
or you know conversation with a with a prospect knowing that it's a click away or two at most two clicks away to get to what yeah. the, the client's keying in on and that's got to be really important in today's sales process yeah it, it's it's you basically can focus on listening right 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 like it's sort of fundamental as this right the problem was most communications is you're thinking about what you're going to say next and right. here you 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 have a playground and i think again maybe there are other tools to do it right like we just i think we're advocating here a new movement that's sort of a conversational engagement and you're able oh you want to drill in here great or like here's you know we thought you would be interested in these five things which ones is the most important for you today this one great let's go in that direction one click smooth you know and and then maybe maybe the best people in the world can do it without without visuals and have the memory you know to to do this i'm not one of them i can tell you that much and i think if you're selling complex services complex products you also want to show right like you may want to have a video you may want to have a real story so it may augment you talking to actually almost have multiple voices, multiple methods of delivering content inside that conversation if you're in the room and certainly, certainly if you're not in the room. Because one thing we know there's a lot of evidence for is nobody can process, you know, same material at great length, you know, without some mix of, you know, drill in here, different learning modes. There's just a ton of evidence from behavioral science, neuroscience, that our minds are wired um, you know, to digest the more diverse material, internalize it and act on it. And I don't know if you've, you've had obviously been part of organizations that do foundational marketing work, right? Like they're, you're executing, you're creating great marketing materials. Did that insight of being part of um, marketing, mar organizations that sell marketing services, marketing execution, were you more aware that this is also the science or do you think it's just your own experience, right? Like how evidence driven were you in this approach? And you were saying, Hey, we're doing this in consumer stuff. Why are we selling the old way? Or like, what was your thought process there? Um, it, it was a bit evidence based. I, I wish I had the facts at my fingertips right now, but when you, when you look at modern uh, marketing processes today, they're moving more and more digital. The digital funnel, especially for technology or SaaS platforms, is typically, you know, you're getting a bunch of awareness and then you may get some emails. But even when you respond to an email, what 100% of people, it's, it's not exactly that, uh, high 80s, low 90s percent of uh, prospects do is they go check out a website first, even if they're planning on responding to an email. And then what they do is when they go to the when they go to the website, why do they do that? Um, a lot of people even try to get away from the landing pages, right? Because they want to see the full fat website and choose for themselves what they want to see and explore and discover. And then once they've discovered it and they feel like they under that this is a good fit for them, then they'll choose to do the outreach. So the likelihood, if you're getting a response and you're having that initial pitch or that initial dis discovery discussion with your prospect, the likelihood that they've already looked at your website, they've already decided there was something interesting to talk about. Since that is, since that's proven from the, from the digital marketing perspective, why would you then design an initial discussion with a prospect that says, hey, I'm gonna move you down my path and not instead just ask you about what did you like about what you saw before you responded to me? Um, and I think that's that's the fundamental thing we really, as sales and marketing organizations, need to do, need to think about. You really need to to fundamentally rethink your your prospect discussions if you're not taking that into account. Interesting. So what you're saying is we all are familiar with the changes in the top of the funnel, right? That's sort of there's no big debate around that anymore, right? And what you're saying is, well, first of all, like, hey, if you have a bunch of PDFs in the top of the funnel and they're not engaging maybe you should consider that but you were focusing really on the middle and bottom of the funnel 
yourself, right? And yes, expanding relationships. So in that world, assuming that at the top of the funnel, you're doing what you're supposed to be doing, you know, are these people are changing somehow. Are they different DNA? Are they like exactly? Are their digital footprint right. going to be different? As you know, because now they're at the middle and bottom of the funnel. You're saying no, they still want to do it. And by the way, the senior decision makers could be still at the very top of the funnel because they didn't. They're kind of coming in cold into some of these conversations. So how do you create this welcoming environment that lets them? pick their own direction, right? And choose their adventure, exactly. feel that they're in control. And it's not, you know, it's not a one way conversation. It's their decision and they are empowered. And it, and it sounds like that's the spirit of what you were, how you wanted to partner with your customers, right? You didn't want it to be, you know, a, a, a kind of, Hey, are we selling a single widget? It had to be like a personalized, you know, a package of experiences and, processes that you wanted to run across with them, right? Yeah, and, and it, it applies for more than just services businesses, but certainly in services businesses, one of the things that we're selling is that we're easy to work with and that we can anticipate um, issues that you may have and that we're experts in what we do. So being able to facilitate a conversation that's conversation that's conversational, um, but but then be able to have that flexibility to move and adjust to what they need and, and anticipate it. You're, there's a big thing about being able to say, this is the value of my service. But then if your sales conversation is the opposite of that, if you say you're economical, but then you ramble on and on about the history of your company for 10 minutes, you're, you're sending mixed signals and certainly yeah. not on your, your key message. So I think that's, that's what we, we really need to to double down, and I encourage all of our uh, my B to my B to B brethren to to think about that. Yeah, I think this is what you're describing. This is almost a tragedy that we work so hard to get these customers in the door, right? Or you know, and then at the moment of truth, right at the fundamental time where you know we now have a chance to be congruent with what we're doing right if we're driving digital transformation let's be digitally transformative if we're driving right. sustainability let's let's start in a sustainable way if we're like it's there's just these these congruency and people describe it in normal kind of coaching and training as as body language right if your body language is incongruent if i'm saying eric i'm really excited to have you on this podcast you know welcome it's great Friday night. You know, like this is not the same thing as like, I'm really right. fired up. Like we're going to have fun. You know, this is like, we've thought a lot about kind of how we could make this your experience. Let's start here. Um, th this is different. And so people, the, the, the what's the, what's the digital equivalent? We're really excited to share with you our vision on digital transformation to begin with, go to attachment, Number one of this right. PDF, page 44. Then we follow up with this answer. You know, like it's just, you think about it, it's kind of crazy. Uh, but yet, um, we're a little bit ingrained in that. So that was in, like, obviously, we think about this incongruency in my world, but I think it, it runs across, right? Like, I think we somehow, I mean, it's amazing. I see learning businesses and you have people there that are you know, instruction designers by training, they know in instructing like learning 101, you know, that people have different learning styles, right? And there you need to adapt to them. And yet when they go sell their learning services, they sell it like it's, you know, they like they don't even understand the first thing to the people who are also aware of that, right? It's just mind boggling. You know, and I kind of wonder why do we, uh, why do we do these things that are inconsistent? Like, what's your take? Like, is it just the the force of a habit and inertia, or we just don't take a step back and look at first principles that you know we don't maybe we don't have time enough to take a look at them. Uh, you know, I'm just curious because you you're also driving change in some of your your clients, so you must deal with similar issues in in offering your your services and products. Yeah. 
Yeah, I, a few things there. Well, first, first, uh, a really quick anecdote. Um, the the biggest example of this I mentioned, you know, there's a lot of, um, you know, sales training out there. Uh, we were recently in the market for some sales training and, um, you know, they all espouse kind of like this discovery model, et cetera, et cetera. And then we engaged this one organization and they did their, you know, their pitch and they said, hi, we're so-and-so and we started at this date and it was 10 minutes in and I'm going, wait, you guys are going to go train our <laughs> folks. And it's like, you're, you're, and this is the antithesis of exactly <laughs> what you're trying to train our organization for. And yeah, that, that, that dichotomy is so, so why are people, why are people doing that? A, I think it's, I think it is an, a lot of it is inertia. You've just seen it done. Somebody trained you that way. This is the only tool set that I know that exists. There's no, it's not great, but it's the only way we have. Right. So there's, I think there's a lot of those those lies that you tell yourself. Another another lie I think that folks tell themselves is you know uh, you know this is completely an art. Uh, there's there's no way to learn this. There's no way no. to do this differently. And I think I'm a I savant. A, I'm a sales savant. Yeah, <laughs> right. And and I think there's I think that's a little bit of a fib to ourselves too. There there are elements that are definitely art and finesse and panache and and then there's parts that are pretty scientific how do how do humans consume information how do you build trust with some you know what are some behaviors and words and things you can say to build trust versus demolish trust how can you how can you be consistent and congruent with what so i think if you if you start out with some of those first principles and you understand a little bit more about human psychology and all of that, then you're able to build better experiences, better conversations, um, and, and things like the, you know, things like that. So I think, I think that's a lot of what's, what's going on. Maybe, maybe not willing to really look, look inside and, 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 uh, decompose what you might be doing wrong. This is fascinating. Um, and I, I think it kind of says a lot about, the difficulties of transition right like we have industry transitions they're difficult people struggle organizations struggle and the technology shifts are happening much faster than we are able to adapt to and so even though we may seem to you or to somebody not maybe to you but to somebody like as a big change we've actually been maniac at shrinking the change to make it uh, adapt on. I think the best customers and you were describing how you were shrinking the change, making it, you know, feel really connected to some existing processes. So it feels like it's just an extension. I think a lot of people come in there and they say, hey, we are going to disrupt this and we're going to disrupt that. And uh, I, I'm not sure that's the model of like it, it happens. There are industry shifts, obviously, but I, certainly in the enterprise, it nearly doesn't happen that fast. Um, but what's what are your thoughts on kind of disruption? I think kind of coming back to where you are now, you're you're dealing with with some of the challenges, and I'll I'll introduce Cal Cody a little bit in my uh, in my kind of understanding what like we love kind of reimagining the the digital book, but you guys. Um, are kind of inheritors of the legacy of R.R. Donnelly, which uh, has been um, started, gosh, what, eight, 860s or something like that? Yep, yep, right, yep, exactly. And and Cal yeah, Cody so is this marketing execution services arm of LSC, which is also the largest producers of book in the U.S. and leading manufacturer, distributor of magazines, catalogs, etc. So you're dealing with kind of merging digital print and you're kind of at the sort of cutting edge of adapting, transforming, changing parts of your business. So guide us a little bit. Like we talked a lot about individual human nature, but you're now kind of dealing with industry and transition and you're innovating in a, in a challenging environment, I, I would think. Um, yeah. So you're kind of uh you're bringing different pieces together, developing capabilities. I'd love to hear how you're managing that. Yeah, we're the 
uh, again, it goes back to, you know, the, the, the old chestnut about looking at your, at your customers. So I think, um, well, well, first let me take a step back. So yeah, you're right. Call Cody, uh, uh, or Cody collective rather has, uh, yeah, sorry, that's your website. With, yeah, exactly. Yeah, By the way, call Cody, go to call There you go. <laughs> Promo uh, so, here. So, so the, the Cody collective is a combination of a couple of different platforms. The first platform is our, uh, print platform. We've got offset and digital, um, printing assets again. Yeah. Catalogs, magazines, that's been our, that's been our history. Um, and we've also got a services platform, creative services and marketing services. And so we kind of combine those um, from the, the legacy LSC name, kind of combined all of those assets into one organization called um, called Cody Collective. So in that new, with that new opportunity, this new platform, new branding, et cetera, it also provides us an opportunity to rethink how um, how we could be servicing our clients and what their needs really are. It's no mystery that uh, that traditional print advertising and marketing has shrunk significantly, right? There's not as many magazines. There's not as many catalogs. A lot of that's digital now. So given that that's the case, there's multiple places to innovate. How can, for the, for the amount that's going to remain, how can we be the most effective and value creation for our for our clients there? Whether that's with innovating on the actual platform itself, or whether that's with introducing additional services and capabilities on top of that traditional work, um, and then it's also where what is what is in the same uh, arena, right? We can't be completely orthogonal, but what is maybe tangential to that world? where there's additional services and capabilities that make that relationship stronger um, and, and so that we can continue to innovate in that w world. If you don't have those strong client relationships and understanding them, then you're not going to have the right to innovate with them because they don't know you and they don't trust you. So we have to focus on that, on that, um, on the customer. So I think that's, that's the place where we're really um, starting and focusing. It's building better relationships um, and uh, a funnel of getting that voice of consumer or customer rather from those customers and introducing them to new ideas and getting their feedback. We're thinking of investing in this. This is a this is something we're seeing in the marketplace. What are your thoughts? So I think a lot of this is about customer engagement and making sure that you you understand what they need. So even in industries where there is a lot of change the the true north is um you know don't dream up the next thing necessarily go dream it up together with your customers absolutely yeah i don't think um uh you know it's it's true there you know you used uh, some steve jobs quotes or or things that he's quoted others but there's the the old chestnut that if anybody if you ask people what they wanted back in the 1800s they'd say a faster horse nobody would say they wanted a car so that that is also very true right there's there's definitely space and need for um for this uh this massive disruption but in in many instances and probably the industries i focus on um there's there's a lot of there's a lot of innovation that doesn't necessarily need to be disruptive to be additive both to your customers and to yourself it's a lot about the innovation and the disruption is really the disruption of actually listening to your customers, actually right. asking your customers, right? Because there's a lot of talk about that. And then there's and then there's putting in the legwork to actually do it. Um, and when you do that, you're, they're going to tell you things. And that's what you have to decide. Is that thing that they just told us? Is that something we really should be helping them with right. when we make an introduction? Can you still add value that way? Or is this something really we should be adding to our quiver because it makes sense that we're going to help them? With that? Got it. Well, and actually, I want to kind of add to this discussion of, uh, you know, faster horse, right? Like, so sometimes we look back at innovations and we say, oh, isn't that funny? Like faster horse, right? But actually, the way to describe the automobile was to at first to say it's horseless carriage. So you still had a reference right. to uh, to that. I think one of my favorite stories that I heard recently from Chris Lockhead 
um, who you know we had a chance to work with at Success Factors. He's kind of a guru of category design, and he said, "Well, Otis, which is the elevators that we all are familiar with, they had a problem introducing elevators back in the days where there is not that many skyscrapers, and you know it was sort of still not a clear and how, how the safety worked." And so he said, "Well." Um, elevator is really a, vert uh, a vertical railroad. So everybody knew what a railroad was and they just kind of, oh, okay, it just goes up and down and it's safe. And it's sort of like they kind of projected a bunch of things. So I think, so that's why I think the word disruption sometimes is overused because the market needs to connect the dots between where they are and where they want to be. If there is change, it was least amount of, thinking in and and kind of headaches and i think was, you know a lot of innovations don't happen like most people could not explain what blockchain is if their life depended on it and you know no surprise it, it's kind of took off in esoteric circles um you know of it but it didn't really fulfill quite some of its promise and so we see this time and time again with technology some people get all fired up about them but the explanations aren't forthcoming in a way that resonates with the problems that people could relate to and and you know uh my uh, my my background i've i've kind of migrated more into the the sales and marketing uh and, and product spaces but my background is actually in engineering and a lot of that's because uh you know it was a well-worn path and and pretty risk averse a lot of the areas i gravitate towards uh are are actually usually more of like the steady eddy environments and the innovation really is more about some of the it's like incremental innovation if you will yeah. uh, and it, and it's about it's about exactly that and a lot of those the the otis example that you gave and, and the the horse uh the horseless carriage example a lot of those feel like just really good product management combined with marketing so fine you ask the horse you ask them what they wanted with their horse and they said a faster horse well you technically del you you decomposed what they what they really wanted, which was speed, right? And then you delivered a solution that had speed, even though it wasn't exactly what they asked for. That's good product. That's just good product management. Um, and I think and I think that's uh, that's a lot of what we're seeking to do, and certainly what I've sought to do um, in in my career at varying levels of of success is figuring out what what we need to do to make our clients successful. And then figuring out what that means in terms of how we what we need to build in order to do that. Um, and I think it's as simple as that. I'll leave I'll leave the giant blockchain discoveries to to someone else. Well, and so you're kind of creating a new category at Cody Collective. You call it marketing execution services. Um, you've brought together a, a dis, different resources. I, I think I'm looking at some of the uh, companies that com came together it's digital lizard continuum marketing production services hudson yard studios so tell us about that process because it sounds like there is a new category of of you know unified service you're bringing in different capabilities uh it, it's probably not trivial mixing cultures uh and you know different people that specialize in different um areas even within marketing and you know creative industry still are probably different um so guide us a little bit about kind of the thought process behind that and that how the, how that transformation came about and, and and did you think about you know that space in general as marketing execution services as a a new new way to deliver service to your customers was this um, something that you have always had in a roadmap and it's just kind of emerged organically kind of would love to hear your perspective on how these transformations happen yeah the the, the through line on all of the you know the the legacy organizations and the the acquisitions that were in our portfolio and and ultimately became Cody the through line a lot of those was a, a focus on subject matter expertise and delivering value, usually through um, either improved quality, lower costs, or the or the same. 
but just really that maniacal subject matter expertise and, and really being able to solve the problem for the customer, whether that was on difficult and challenging ways of getting your catalog to look different or different coatings or different experiences inside that catalog, or whether it was helping uh, source or build a marketing execution organization, a sourcing ex uh, organization inside of a, um, you know, some larger companies. The through line of that was really about trying to marry the the more science of execution with the art of under, really understanding that subject matter. And so since that was the through line, it made a lot of sense to combine those all of those different organizations underneath exactly that header. The 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 marketing of it, if you will, is you're going to call Cody, Cody Collective. Yeah, um, in, it worked because to... this is I got confused myself, but I should know better. There you go. There, so, so now it's sort of like I'm like I'm concept. calling Cody. I like it. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, the, the concept was to to call Cody in order to get you know to have somebody else take care of it. Go to the experts that can take care of it. Whether it's something like you know on the print print platforms or whether it's a service, you're going to experts that are going to be able to to support you. So. That's that's kind of the the impetus behind that, and what what the what the real work is now. Um, well, let me pause there. The and that was all driven by customer feedback, right? What what are you looking for? Well, you can't just in today's market you can't just be a printer. What are you looking for? Well, in today's market you can't just be a middleman. So figuring out you know taking that feedback and creating this organization where we have. We have the best of both worlds. Um, that was customer driven. What the next level of that looks like is what are those additional services? What is the model, the, the, the delivery model need to be? What, how do we need to prove value, not just to our immediate clients, the buyers, but how do we provide value or explain it better to the folks that those people report into. So it's not just solving the problem, it's also communicating the results. It's it's all of those things. So that's that's the next level. And I think that's what the next level of innovation looks like at our organization, adding digital tools, even for things that are still physical and improving the communication and analytics that come from the work that we do because data is data's everywhere. So that's, and, and a lot of that's being driven by what, our customers are telling us now. And so it, it does come back to, to this topic that we came out on the, the beginning as to why we connected in the first place, because you're bringing a set of capabilities together, but not everybody wants all the same capabilities. So yes. you can't cookie cutter it, right? Yes. But they want you to know that there is one place where they can go and have a trusted partner that could meet their needs or find other partners that would support those needs. But like one throat to choke. I don't know if there's a better term for it. Uh, one nose to touch. We prefer one, no one nose to touch. One nose to touch. That's that's <laughs> yeah. One one champagne and one caviar, you know, <laughs> to taste. There's your, your uh, French is showing. Yeah, the French uh intentional here. Yeah. Um in interestingly, uh, a side note. Uh, I tell my team that one of the inspirations for some of the things we're doing for Relate to is walking past a patisserie in Paris and, and seeing all the little macaroons and how they have different colors and flavors and saying, wouldn't it be great if we could, you know, this is sugar stuff, obviously, and it's tasty, but it's couldn't, like, couldn't the good stuff feel and taste and be experienced in the same way. So I think there's something to, to the French way, but the back to your situation, I feel uh, like you, the, there's a shift that's been going on, but it's probably even more important now where, uh, you know, there was a sort of wow market. We're all growing. We're going to try new things, you know, a little bit pre like always in the growth spurts, you know, there's a, people are a little bit more open, not not looking at the cost draconically, and they tend to have at least in technology there was a proliferation of serv of of solutions, but also I think in services. And I think the world is changing because hey, I'm a complex large organization. 
it's hard to have multiple vendors and coordinate between all those vendors. And so I want to have one partner that, you know, is accountable for results. And we see some of this kind of in our world, like we started with one content format, you know, of presentations, and then we now have support 20 content formats from various types of documents and to videos and so on. And so that's been really interesting. Um, and then um, the use cases, you know, in our case expanded in your case, you know, they're very, very broad. And, yes. and so we're seeing that, that there is, People always like some, they do want this quick start sometimes and a quick win if it's a new customer. But in general, there is the kind of this appetite for knowing that you you can expand and trust and grow as a service. And it sounds like that's your your entry point with existing customers or, or new customers. But it's hard to communicate that when you have you know, a slew of things that they may need. Right. And so this is where you, you, you're coming back to how do we create this uh, experience that allows you to de 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 deploy a complex suite of services and capabilities without overwhelming you with complexity. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and if you think about that, um, if you think about uh, what it might, one like the the nightmare scenario of working with a company like us that might mean you're talking to seven different account managers from all of our seven different you know services and you're getting seven different uh invoices and you have all these different phone numbers to call and so yeah thinking thinking critically about um what that experience needs to be like once you're already with us but also translating that back to our earlier theme, translating that and telegraphing that all the way back to the first conversation. If you, if you know already that you can't service a client by being confusing and frustrating to work with once you start working with them, you can't also start that. You certainly then can't start the conversation where it is confusing to get the information that I want and, and all of that. So, so. You know, we do have this wide breadth. We do have, you know, physical assets that produce physical products. And we also have services that are, you know, just our, our team of experts. But um, depending on who you're talking to, sometimes they just need one or the other or a subset of one or the other. And if you go in there and you, you spend 25 minutes trying to explain all of that, you're already not listening to them. You're already not um, paying attention to their needs, you're already difficult to work with. So finding the the right way to to communicate it um, is really important. And I that's why I take my role in kind of this uh, sales, marketing, sales support uh, leadership role. I take it very very seriously uh, because it really goes to the essence of what it's like to work with us. Um, and and that it has to start at even at that prospect discussion. Amazing. I think this is a great summary of, of some of the topics that we covered, which is you never get a, a second chance to make a first impression, right? And I think in your case, whether it's a digital first impression or in a meeting that is supported with digital experiences, you know, it's fundamentally being starting with the customer and then working backwards. And, you know, it's just amazing to to see you articulated so clearly. Thank you for inspiring us uh, on the journey and co-creating this types of experiences together. I think anybody who's listening to this, who has a complex product or service or physical complex, um, you know, solutions that they need to deliver. Uh, I, I think you should really to, to your point, Eric, kind of knock yourself out a little bit of status quo of this is the way we've always done because the customers are changing at a minimum in their con consumer digital behaviors. And if we're not catching up with that as the B2B innovators, whether we're in marketing sales or delivery, we're not doing anybody any favors. We're not delighting customers. We're kind of, we're not driving our customer experience team later in the journey to, to be held to a higher standard. And, um, I think it been an interesting what what kind of I think surprised me actually and probably really good for people to know is that you were enabling the enable you were the enabler for the people that are interacting 
with the potential customers and with the customers in doing that. So, so it's not all about kind of uh, top of the funnel uh, a kind of a journey. It's sort of across the journey. So Eric, any last thoughts of wisdom that you want to share with our audience on, on kind of your, the journey that you've taken and what are you've changed? Like you've, you know, worked, you know, this and applied even our solution, you applied in multiple areas. What have you learned from this and kind of what tips do you have uh, for what, maybe what you wouldn't do. You just, we talked about what you did. <laughs> you know, what, what wouldn't you do now? Uh, yeah, I, I think, um, let's see, any parting any parting shots? I think we covered a lot. Um, you know, uh, focus on, on customers actually listening and talking to them and getting that feedback is yeah. immensely important. Making sure that you're, um, uh, that you're, congruent with what your brand message is and then all steps of your process, not just the delivery of it, but also in the, in the beginning. Um, and I guess the, the only other thing I would, I would add in from what, uh, maybe I would, what I wouldn't do is, um, you know, like I said, I have a engineering background and, you know, that operational background. And I tried to take marketing and sales, uh, when I first got into this area. Um, a lot more like that approach, a lot more linear, a lot more. It's just simply an equation and something to solve. And, and I think, um, allowing yourself to question your, the, the existing behavior, whether it's the existing behavior of the industry itself or yourself and really thinking about what that process needs to look like and what your customers really want, breaking yourself from that. So. I think that's something I would, I hope I wish, I, I wish I learned that a little bit earlier, uh, but I'm, I'm certainly glad I have. Amazing, amazing um, uh, insights, Eric. Eric, how can people find you? Uh, what's the best way to follow uh, you and the uh, Cody Collective? Um, I, I'm actually on a pretty good social media diet myself. So I, I'm found mostly uh, exclusively on LinkedIn, but uh, you can reach uh Cody Collective at paulcody.com. Um, and uh, we look forward to hearing from you. Amazing. Thank you so much.